Nikita Blair, who blogs at blairviews.com. She's a communications student at the who's just about to begin her third year of study at the University of Guyana. She started her blog, Blair Views, um, in 2016 as a way to document and share her opinions about the books she reads throughout her yearly Goodreads challenges. She soon began to deviate from this format, writing about the things that bothered her in her social and online communities. This evening, she'll be reading one of her latest pieces, The Empathy of Horses, which evolved from such concern deviation. Nikita's also a photographer, which she didn't put into the, into, and, and, and photography is also useful when you're blogging. Um, she currently splits her blogging efforts between WordPress and Medium, writing a book about books and bothers alike. Um, my name is Nikita Blair, and the piece that I'll be presenting is The Empathy of Horses. I didn't originally have a prologue, but I decided that I needed to add some context to this reading so that you can get a full understanding of why I wrote this piece. Prologue. Horses were among the first animals to intrigue me, to capture my attention and force my imagination wide open. I read about them, dreamed about becoming a veterinarian for them, and when I got my first cameras, I stalked and photographed them all throughout the neighborhood, against the sagely advice of my parents and family friends. It was through these pictures and the ultimate internet juxtapositions that I realized that our local horses weren't that healthy. As beautiful as they were, they suffered from injuries and parasitic infections throughout their lives, and many died prematurely, often accidentally. So when a mare died right next to my house, and the pieces of her story began to come together, the simmering concern that I felt for almost a decade finally began to reshape itself in prose. I was drowning in assignments then, but I wrote those pieces down, and when the last books closed and the final exams were written, I cracked open the notebook and poured over her story again. Then, I blogged. This is the empathy of horses, my effort to raise awareness about the conditions of our local animals. We woke up late that Sunday morning, and there she was, the swell of her belly rising like a smooth brown hillock above the short fluffy grass on which she lay. Hovering over her sun-worn fresh was a single nervous sentinel, her last and now orphaned foal. He pushed and prodded her body, nudging at the now milkless spot between her hind legs as we all stood there watching through the chain link fence that separated us. We felt the foal's grief, felt the helplessness waft through this poor separator towards us as he screamed in shrill alarm. We wanted to help him. Goodness knows we did. We wanted to pick him up and lead him somewhere safe, but where was safe? This was not like America or England or Germany. We couldn't dial a few numbers and summon a wailing veterinary ambulance to whisk away this crying child. After all, this is a place where old horses come to die, where their horses, where dogs, their necks twisted backwards and bodies crushed under speeding wheels, fester and mummify in the fester and mummify on the sun-baked asphalt until, at last, they become one with the roadside dust. We swear to avoid their lifeless bodies, lest their stench follow us home, as a testament to our lack of empathy and the conditioned numbness that replaced it. They get no barrier rights, these creatures. We treat them in death as we did in life. We forget that they exist until they become a burden to us. The mare was going to be a burden to us. We treated her differently. We had to. She died at the intersection of three fences in the space between my two neighbors and me. I imagine the last thing she saw was the swaying coconut fronds billowing in the salty air above her. Or perhaps she stared at a gap between her three fences that bore horse and goat and cow tracks hidden beneath the falling leaves and composting grass. The fool 
was long gone when I woke on Monday morning, and two men were preparing the mare for cremation. They had been riding past on their way to work when they noticed the bloating hillock. They stopped and jumped into action, knowing that if they didn't get rid of her, she would remain and putrefy everything around us. She would swell and her flesh would melt away as she returned to the soil. The dogs, those skittish creatures with mangy coats, coats draped over protruding ribs, would come for her, too. They would tear into her body and guard themselves fat, taking pieces of her away and scattering her stench and morbidity throughout the neighborhood. The men laid old tires on her body like wheat and blessed her skin with generous sprinklings of gasoline. They watered the grass around her and soaked the wooden fence against which she lay to prevent her pyre from spreading beyond her final resting place and possibly consuming all that we had built to keep unwanted life outside of our neatly defined territory. As we leaned over the back door and listened to her body crack and snap in the fire, my mother told me her story. It was everything she had gleaned while doing her gardening and watching the fall that Sunday, or what she heard from the men who tried to get rid of her body, or from the white lady in the flat house down the road who came to her yard in tears to see her old friend as she returned to the soil. lady had been feeding the horses for years. They always congregated at her gate, waiting for fresh water and treats on the hottest afternoons. They took refuge on her, on her bridge. Sometimes, when I walked by as a teenager, I would see them tucked against the gate on their canopy of hot pink bougainvilleas. They would stand there, their tails swinging and swishing over their bodies as they ignored the three yapping dogs and the croaking parrot behind their fence. When she drove in, they would part slowly, allowing her to return home. She knew all of them intimately, and when the mare got in trouble, she went to her. Maybe she had an accident. Maybe she cut herself on an improperly discarded something while looking for food. Maybe, she was, maybe someone was just cruel to her. One day, she turned up at the white lady's gate with a long gash down her chest. She had cleaned the wound and sewn it together, perhaps with a steady hand, a grim expression, and the unflavored dental floss from her bathroom stall. The mare was getting better, she said. She was looking healthier every day, until she disappeared. She was gone for three days, she said, only to reappear as a dead body that Monday morning when the men summoned her from her morning routine to the news of the recently fallen. She cried then, lamented that the mare must have eaten a grasshopper, the bane of all equine and bovine dining, and that must have killed her. It wasn't the wound. She was getting better. It couldn't have been the wound. Whatever killed her will be a mystery to all of us. Maybe it was an infection. Maybe a poisonous grasshopper. We found her lying in the soft grass while her fold stomped the hard earth with its tiny hooves. He screamed and charged to chase away the stray dogs honing in on the, on the f smell of carrion. We thought the dogs would bring the foal down, make quick work of him and lay him to rest in pieces like his mother before him. But the foal had a strong spirit and a will to protect his mother, even as the smell of death attracted more of these scavengers to her defenseless baby. His cries carried far, and the urgent distress squeal summoned the matron. I imagine she came with her own foal, ambling along in that calm, unhurried gait that marked her long life of semi-feral luxury. My mother said she must have been at least 20 years old, perhaps even older than I am. She was a large buckskin mare, her strange coat color setting her apart from the sea of brown she led. That Sunday afternoon, the matron wandered to the foal, examining him and her fallen sister's body. He stopped crying then, standing there in silence as they both looked, as they both looked over the stone mirror. Minutes passed, neither moved. Then slowly, the matron led the foal away. The matron was wise, my mother said. She had allowed the foal to grieve, but faced the realities of that grief. I reckon that it went to I reckon that I went from the dead to the living, letting the foal know that although, my mo although his mother was gone, there was a community of other mothers waiting patiently to greet him. They would raise him. They would keep him safe. 
and they, will, they allowed him to mourn and helped him to move on. This is the empathy of horses, these large, gentle creatures. They are kind enough to adopt the lost, patient enough to allow their young ones to grieve, and wise enough to let them face the truth of that loss, rather than leaving them to wallow in ignorance and sorrow. Maybe this was just a unique situation. The place the mare fell was just right. The fact that the herd had other mares with young foals was perfect. Maybe the mare knew these things. And maybe she calculated her final resting piece for this very purpose. Or maybe the mare died where she did to summon us, humans, only for us to turn our backs on her and her baby. Her death was inconvenient and a bit annoying for us. She left a foal behind and that distressed us. But we didn't take the time. The horses did. Perhaps this proves that empathy, instinctual or otherwise, is more universal than we think. We just need to know where to look for it so that we may recapture it and emulate it again. Thank you.